Okay. <laughs> so I don't want to be that, that person that says, you know, this is, this is, I'm the only thing between you and drinks, but I feel like this is very much true at this point. I know you've just been digesting a whole lot of heavy hitting content about IP in this space. So we're going to take it up a notch, um, a little lighter to, to the funding side of things, um, VCs and Web3 when funded. And I know you're all sort of getting settled and coming into the room, but maybe a bit of a show of hands um, to those of you in the room who here are the builders, kind of thinking about funding. Yep, there's a few of you here. Who of you are actually investors, kind of uh, either you know in individual projects or looking broadly at the Web3 space investing-wise? Yep, a few. And who's here just still trying to break down what they heard about IP in the space and um, we'll, we'll leave when they're ready. <laughs> All right. Um, so half an hour is not a lot of time. We're going to keep it short, sharp and sweet. Um, but I want to introduce my incredible panel uh, that we have here today. On my left here is Simon Kant. It's not very often that you get to interview your uh, previous boss on a panel. So this is kind of fun. So Simon is managing partner at Reinventure, the Westpac-backed venture fund. They've been investing in crypto since 2014, which uh, is pretty early by, by lots of standards, but especially so in Australia. Uh, they first invested in Coinbase back then and were the first Aussie VC to actually invest in Immutable uh, in 2019 in their Series A. And Simon has also uh, since then carved out quite an active uh, investor role in, actually active angel investor role in the Web3 space as well. Thanks, Simon. Uh, all the way to the, to the far left, we have Ben Simpson, who introduced himself or had his introduction into crypto in 2016. He's a long-term investor whose mission is to simplify the asset class and help educate and onboard everyday people into crypto through Collective Shift, where he's currently founder and CEO, a pioneering education and research platform on crypto. Uh, he's also passionate about NFTs and is, and is a proud uh, moonbird. There's a few moonbirds I can see in the audience here. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have like a cat call or something or a bird call you have to say to each other. Um, <laughs> and right in the middle, uh, we have Kyle Walker, uh, GM of Upside. Um, I did tweet to Kyle to say when bio, uh, but I didn't get it. So you can do your own. <laughs> Give yourself a shout out. T talk to us about Upside Dow. Hey, uh, thank you, Lauren. So Upside Dow, we're a collective of uh, Web3 founders, natives, uh, industry experts. Our goal is to, uh, to, to support the next wave of uh, founders building mostly here in Australia. So we want to support the builders and, and the people who are bringing this great technology and, and the opportunity that, the, that it brings everyone. Um, yeah, we want to help you, back you and support you to be successful and, and uh, yeah. Thanks, Kyle. And I should have introduced myself, I guess. I'm Lauren Kaplan. I'm the Startup Ecosystem Support Manager at AWS Startups uh, and resident DGen, or so Greg, has told me I can call myself. Uh, so that's what I'm here today for. Previously at Startmate, Australia's largest accelerator program, and before that at reInventure. Um, so it's been a journey. Uh, so I want to kick off talking about sources of capital when we think about Web3 funding and just funding more broadly, uh, maybe a bit of a state of the union on venture capital and the funding landscape right now. So Simon, over your career, you've spanned traditional and corporate venture capital, which we'll now refer to as trad VC, um, to the more recent focus on Web3 and crypto investments, particularly off the back of uh, the Coinbase exit, uh, which, which reInventure was um, part of. Can you describe the sentiment on both sides of that? that investor market right now? Yeah. Oh, there might be a... Okay, cool. <laughs> it's working? Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think it's probably fair to say it's probably changed dramatically. I mean, it's been changing um, by degrees, and then I think it's um, changed dramatically in the last uh, week or so, obviously. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and it was interesting because, I mean, to be frank... Um, you know, there, there was very little interest in, in crypto uh, in the VC, in the traditional VC market back in 2018, 2019, almost zero, to be frank. Um, and obviously we had the bull run and suddenly every VC in Australia was into crypto and had a Web3 division and focus. How many are in the room? Not that many. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, not many. Oh, burn. Ow. Um, I didn't say it. Um, nor did I pay her to say it. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think it will drop off. It, it, it has dropped off, without a doubt. Um, I think even some of the most active are now doing very little over the last six months. Um, it will come back. So um, I don't think we should be, you know, concerned. And to be honest, there was 
kind of too much money going in and it was creating very strange um, you know distortions in the market it's fair to say and I mean the reality is if you look at FTX that is a classic distortion in the market you know when so much power goes I mean it's never a, it's not a great thing when all the power sits with investors because investors can really turn into dickheads when they have all the power <laughs> it's true and and particularly investors you know if you've been a career finance person, suddenly you've got all this power, everyone wants to know you, they're all coming up to you going, oh, let me tell you about this, that and the other. It's very easy to, to believe that, you know, you start to get the Michael Jackson complex, no one telling you you're an asshole, um, And so you start to believe your own bullshit. But um, it's also not great when it goes the other way because when it goes the other way, it results in no due diligence. Um, and, you know, it's clear that very few people did due diligence on, on FTX when they made that investment. And, you know, that can create really poor disciplines in terms of the things that are getting backed. And it creates this cult of personality. And that is really when you get to peak problem territory. I mean, the peak of the problem in the boom was when what was winning was personalities, right, rather than the underlying tech. So we'll, we're now coming back into a phase where people building real applications are, are going to be what's getting supported. And I think that's actually a, a really positive thing. Obviously, I think it's terrible that people have lost so much money in this process, and it's you know, it's really unfortunate. Um, and I think, however, I think it will make things stronger in the next cycle. So yeah, um, I think I think we're back to where we were probably like early 2019. We're sort of back there again. We just had this massive mountain in between. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I mentioned, and I'm uh, involved with the outside guys, and I think they're doing some, some great stuff as well. Um, you know, I was involved in investing in the dot-com era. So my first go at VC was in 2000. And, um, you know, all the things that we thought would happen did play out. All the things that everyone had predicted back in 99, 98, you know, they said that there were going to be these social networks and it was going to look like this and there'd be these network effects and yada, 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 yada. And all these people raised money off those theories and then it all collapsed under the weight of this kind of theory plus ego plus hype and then, right? And, but then they emerged. But mass behavior change takes decades. It does not take one or two years, okay? So you have to build for the long term. And, you know, something Coinbase, I have to say, did brilliantly. They raised in the boom and they spent for the bust. So they would raise every, every boom cycle. You know, they did their Series C in 2013, which was where we participated on the back of that Series C. We were late into that Series C in 2013 um, on the downside of that cycle. They raised again in um, the 2018, 2017 boom. And obviously they listed in the, the 2021 button. But they just consistently have raised money in the boom and they've always spent conservatively knowing that there would be a winter coming. And I think that's the way everybody needs to run their projects in this space. You can't assume that you've, you know, you're going to be out there again in a year raising your next round because it may not be there. These are kind of four-year cycles. So you should think in those terms. It's hard to cut you off when your battery's gone flat. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, Kyle, maybe to, to riff off what Simon has been talking about, I guess there's the um, – were any of the things about the traditional venture cycle and the kind of the power dynamics and all of that, did they form the basis of what you were thinking about building with Upside Down? Can you talk a little bit about that side of things? Yeah, I think uh, – so, so one of the – perspectives we took on it was in the bull run that dynamics were really distorted as Simon said and we were noticing that there was this constant trend of projects launching based on hype speculation concept lots of power in in founders hands and investors to get in on the rounds and get in early enough we're not doing due diligence it was almost a how can I sell myself to get some allocation here and typically then as a retail investor and people who are in in the market you're then trying to get in next and then ultimately it's all built up and the price has got to come down eventually, inflated prices. So it's not healthy um, and founders raise too much money and then that comes with a lot of other complexities. And so in, in terms of borrowing from Web2 and saying, well, it's not like startup funding was so broken and we've done it so poorly. It's actually evolved and improved over time. And 
those disciplines and some of the things that have are there for a reason were missing. And so personally, I was sitting there thinking, well, why is this occurring? And, and part of that is looking and thinking, well, angel syndicates are often built up of people who have been successful founders previously, and there was a gap in Web3. And so the thesis was that if we could bring together and, and focusing on Australia and, and again personally noticing that in so many great projects, DAOs, protocols, there were Australians. So we've over-indexed, we've performed well. Can we get this group of people together? Because then we can start to bring back some of the, um, the, the Web2 principles that mean we can invest and we can work with teams around their tokenomics to say, well, let's get this right and actually make sure we're aligned with you for the long term to deliver a product that meets a user's needs, as opposed to let's launch, we've we've gone on a high vel and then we spend, we've got all this money, now we're treasury managers, we're not product people, and we've got to try and think about how to maintain our price, otherwise our community, our users, who are also often investors, are then saying, you know, devs do something. And it's a great meme and it's funny and like I love saying it, And but, but the reality is like, we're laughing at the fact there was an issue, which is everyone was so worried about the price as opposed to the product. Um, and so I think to answer your question, Lauren, like, um, there are actually lots of things about Web 2 that we, we wanted to bring into Web 3 uh, and, and we saw that if we're going to do it, how do we do it in a way that does adopt those Web 3 values and we have transparency and we have distribution and we, we have all these great things about Web 3 but we don't forget the disciplines that are really important in helping founders build great companies. And are any of the assumptions that you had when you started out been fundamentally changed through the process? Uh, well, I suppose, yeah, d definitely. Um, there's probably two sides of it. One side is in terms of building the DAO and, and having people contribute that um, we wanted to bring people in who were going to be what we thought were great sources of information and support for these founders, but they're all builders and founders themselves, so they're busy. So we've got... it's um, everyone's availability varies and changes. So that's what one component of it. So in terms of actually how we are as a, a investment DAO, like there's some... The, one of the things is we are a DAO and no one works um, for upside DAO in that, that manner. And when you look at traditional VCs, they have employees. But the, the luxury that we have is that we don't have to hire for a specific, um, a specific domain and then try and make sure we've got enough to justify that person. So what it means is that we do rely on some people heavily when we've got gaming teams coming in and lots of gaming traffic, but then it's, they might then become unavailable and we might not have deals in that space. So that's one. Um, other assumptions is probably just more dynamic things like equity versus tokens. And I think everything was token and, and that's great because there's liquidity and that's another benefit of Web3. But there's downside of having a token and having investors and everyone who can move off you quickly. So I think one of the things that is emerging is we're starting to see a lot more, tr again, Web2 type dynamics such as equity or equity with token warrants and things coming through. Fascinating. Uh, so Ben, you've recently raised a round and I guess in your process of deciding how to capitalise the business, did you consider more alternative decentralised methods of fundraising or were you like, no, that the more traditional equity round path is for me? Yeah, so our company is more of a web 2.5 company, I call it. You know, we're like a subscription company that talks about crypto, but we're not a token or a blockchain. So we did consider it in the bull market because everyone was talking about raising a token, everyone wanted an NFT, it was great in theory, but I, I'm a big believer of like, do, does it really need a token? Do we really need a token? The answer was no at the time. So we went down the equity path um, and that's been a good decision for us. It's, we're different to most crypto companies in a sense where we're raising off the back of, you know, you know monthly recurring revenue, churn rates, et cetera. Um, so in, in that path, it's actually been, I think, probably more difficult to raise because we're trying to target investors that are not really Web3 and not really SaaS. It's like an intersection of fintech, crypto, um, and Web3. So it's been an interesting journey, but uh, I started to try to raise in the middle of the bull market back in December last year, and uh, it was the first time I ever raised, and it was a complete disaster because I had no idea what I was doing. And I look back at the at the deck I had and the story I had, and it was it, it was awful now, you know, eight months on. So a, a learning lesson for me as a founder and any builders out there looking to raise is that um, so I, I found a lot of um, lessons learning through through mentors. Because the reality is um, capital allocators, the, the good ones, will grill you. And I got grilled when I first started. I didn't really know what I was doing, where I was trying to go, the story, the exit strategy, my numbers. And that really taught me a lesson of like, okay, I need to go back and figure that out. 
and now six months on, you know, we're just closing the raise now. I have learned a lot and it's, it's, a, it's an iterative process, but I think it's about knowing your business, knowing your numbers and having a product that can sustain without capital. I think that was the most important thing I realised. Like, we needed to build a business that was going to be okay without capital, not raising capital to build a business. You raise capital to, to grow the business that's already working and that was the lesson I learned. So can I just clarify, at no point did it feel appropriate to play League of Legends on investor calls? Just... <laughs> It just didn't seem like the thing to do, no? <laughs> no, I was still sweaty palm in every call, so <laughs> no time of league legends. So can you talk about the due diligence side of things? I mean, you touched on, you know, there were more traditional metrics, but you were trying to, I guess, compile a few different indicators that might make sense for your business uniquely. What did you feel like investors were looking for from your business to make sense of that, that Web 2.5 model? The story was really important. I didn't have a story when I first started. Um, and I, I've never, you know, been on the other side of the calls as an asset allocator and as a first-time founder. I found that investors really, um, uh, they, they looked at a story. A story could be understood much easier than just straight numbers, I found. Uh, and the due diligence process was for us was having all that information ready. So whether it was the, the finances, subscription data, the product, the roadmap, having everything in a data room ready to go so you, so you know that information. Because if you go into those calls not knowing that, I find that the investor thinks you'll, you're a little bit amateur and you're not really prepared. So that was a, that was a big thing for me. And Simon, as somebody who has done more of your you know, SaaS, fintech specifically businesses, um, there's a playbook of sorts around due diligence, especially at particular stages. What's changed in your approach to due diligence as you start to look at more of these Web3 investments as an angel or you know, from a funding perspective as well? More or less? Yeah, um, well, as an angel, I mean, the truth is probably less. And I think this is one of the phenomena of being an angel is that you, um, you may, you're, you're writing smaller checks and you have less stake. Um, you're writing more of them and so you have less time to kind of allocate to each one is just the, the simple truth, which is why something like Upside is, actually becomes helpful because um, you need a little bit of the hive mind to work to be able to do those things effectively um, as an angel. Um, so, yeah, um, I think in um, it, DD, due diligence is very much stage relevant. Do you know what I mean? Uh, rather than space relevant. So, you know, at, at the seed level or pre-seed level even sometimes where we have invested, sometimes it's literally nothing to due diligence other than, you know, it, it is a founder that you believe in and... Um, the theory, the thesis makes sense. And we have made some of those investments. We just had an exit, one of them, for 200 million. So it can work. It's not that, you know, um, but, you know, that risk of a founder who tells a good story, I guess that's always there at that level. But you're risking a smaller amount of money. So it's it's just the nature of the, the game. I guess in Web3, and perhaps it's not been a, an experience you've had directly, but you've also got the potential for the founders to be a non or you don't, you don't get that opportunity to build a personal sure. connection. Has that, have you experienced that? Have you avoided that because it's not a space you would necessarily feel comfortable making a gut-driven investment? Yeah, I haven't made any really uh, non-investments. Um, and I, look, we've always, I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't, and maybe that just makes me a boomer, because I am a boomer, <laughs> let's be clear. That's fair. Relevant yeah. to, relative to this room. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, in VC, we've always had the attitude, I don't want to make an overseas investment unless I know why I'm at the table. You know, so one of our big things with Coinbase was we knew why we were at the table. We were at the table because we had a bank behind us. They wanted bank legitimacy. That was why they were prepared to open the door to us. You know, it's pretty simple. We've invested in overseas ventures a couple of other times, and most of the time we've lost money because... If you're not sure why you're there, you're probably there because you don't understand FOMO. the story. <laughs> you don't, you're FOMO. You don't understand the story. You are the dumb money at the table, essentially, if you're <laughs> going into an overseas venture. With an Australian venture, you're more likely to be somebody who can... You can do the due diligence, meet the people. You can get a feel for what's going on. So I love how you reference with Upside Down, like the, the hive mind concept. So, Kyle, how does that actually play out in practice? Can you talk about the due diligence mechanisms? Uh, yeah, so we, we learnt really quickly that um, we, the whole DAO doesn't need to vote on everything. And we're all, uh, we, we took this approach when 
constructing the DAO. Like it was, everyone was um, had, had private relationships with each other, and so this group came together. But you know, it's, it's it's a bit of a buzzword, sorry, but mutually exclusive, comprehensively exhaustive. So everyone brings a unique skill set or perspective. But collectively, what it allows us to do is look at a lot of things. Um, but what we recognise is, well, there's no point getting um, someone who is a DeFi founder who's got great expertise in DeFi to come and evaluate a game game um, product or or look at Web3 tooling, for example. So we, we learn to divide and conquer. And so we've created these decentralised working groups where if, if an opportunity comes in, someone from the DAO will introduce it. It's been screened. What we then do is see, well, who's interested, who's available and who's got the capabilities to adequately, adequately assess this. And if we get four people together, that constitutes a working group and that's a live deal. And that group will then meet with the founders, they'll do the due to the due diligence and they've got autonomy to invest 100,000 US dollars of the DAO's money uh, if three out of four or 75% vote to approve it. So we tried to put in a high hurdle um, in terms of sample size, like you know, four people isn't, isn't huge, but it's working, it allows us to be more responsive, look at more deals, be more responsive to founders. We you know, want to continue to get better at the, the warm no type thing because sometimes you know, it kind of teeters and people don't dislike it enough to say no. So we're always looking to improve it. But I think that that's the way that we are effective is by dividing and conquering and just making sure that we have enough skill sets available for the, the, the domains or the categories required to do due diligence um, to the level that is required for where we're investing, which is, which is early. And so, I mean, over the last few years, the, this idea of platform support or portfolio support services has really become popularised across VC around the world, uh, you know, helping uh, portfolio companies make strategic connections, uh, peer support networks, uh, hiring, go-to-market support, all of those kinds of value adds. And that's driven the popularity of a number of funds or they have been able to carve out a, a bit of a, a niche for themselves. It's a bit more table stakes now over time, but are these kinds of support services valuable and attractive to Web3 founders? I might just jump to you, Ben, in terms of what you were actually looking for in your investors. Did you think about those sorts of things when you talked to particular investors? Yeah, we did. Uh, we targeted more angel investors and uh, family offices for our round. We found that we were probably in a either too early or just in a weird niche for, for VCs. And in terms of our growth, I found that VCs really, it's a numbers game. You know, they're trying to turn you into a billion dollar company. And for me, I really value freedom, decision making and doing what the fuck I want when I want. So <laughs> having too much of a cap table. <laughs> Call me a fraudster. <laughs> <laughs> That's way too early. That's never too early. Wow. Um, no, so we, we targeted more angel investors. We, had, we, we have about three VCs on, um, and, and they've been very helpful in terms of strategic partnerships and relationships, but that wasn't a big focus for us. Um, you know, we, we found that we have a, a, a good product and we're developing a lot of the relationships already here in Australia. So, yeah, we, we, we went out with a, a bit of a focus, and, um, yeah, that was our target. Yeah. And, Kyle, you have based upside down around this idea of, I guess, past operators, uh, ex-founders or previous founders coming together to support that next generation. How do you think about that value add um, that the, the community provides? Yeah, I think it's huge and, and for, for a couple of reasons. One, like when we speak to founders, what they're attracted to is the fact that they look at our DAO and who's there and how they might help them. So it's very much them telling us who in the DAO that they would like to speak to and what sort of help that they would like. So that that's certainly validates our thesis. I think the second thing is yeah, looking at history and, and um, you know, Startmate is a great example of this. And you know, I've been through some of the Startmate process um, and, and community groups and can see the value of these past founders giving back to the next generation and, and just sharing the war stories and trying to, sh I guess, lessen the learning curve, um, helping to soften the blows of, of learning things um, when building new, new products, but we're, we're really pragmatic in terms of understanding how best we can help people. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the DAO are, are all founders and are all quite busy. So to improve that ability to continue to help and serve people, we're looking to say, well, who's not in the DAO but is in our network? And who's available? Who are people that we think are fantastic operators in their uh, respective areas? And how might we create like this modular incubator thesis which allows founders at reasonable cost and time effectively to lean on people who just aren't inside our DAO. So I think, again, to go back to Web3 values, like we don't want to integrate and, and hoard all of the expertise and advice. We actually want to grow the ecosystem. And if that means 
partnering with trusted people outside of our, our group to support the founders we're investing in or the ones that we pass on because we might not be able to support them or they might not fit be a good fit with us. Um, that's, yeah, that's the next stage and the next evolution of what we're trying to do. for. Yeah. And Simon, you were, you know, apart from being early to Web3, you were early to invest in platform services at reInventure. Have you, I know this, <laughs> um, have you, I mean, the, the nature of the help that the Web3 companies, you've had Immutable, you've had Coinbase, the nature of the help that they require from an investor um, is, is slightly different in nature. What are you seeing now that you're pursuing more of that angel investment path? Are you more hands off with your investments or can you see actually a lot of the, the legacy knowledge of startups 1.0, 2.0 is actually really valuable in this next segment of the space? Oh, I think it's even more so. I definitely think it's even more so than than it has been in, in Web 2, actually way more so. Um, and it's it's interesting to see that how the platforms have emerged um, with some of the um, VCs uh, overseas, particularly that have been in this space for a while. So we've been investors um, both through the fund um, and more recently directly in Polychain, which is Olaf Carlson, where he was employee number one, one I think, at Coinbase, and then set up his own fund. Um, and watching them build out their platform has been pretty interesting. So you know. Certainly, in, the, in more recent times, there's there's key aspects of platform that a lot of um, ventures are looking for, and a lot of the time, for example, that looks like liquidity provision, particularly in DeFi um, type spaces, um, but also expertise, for exam example, around you know structuring your tokens and your you know your releases and all of those sorts of things. Like it's a real, um, it's a really deep sort of vertical now of. Um, hard one experience and expensively one experience. So there's real value in having some of that. And so I think the the good VCs are able to provide um, some of that and help help founders to sort of walk that path without you shooting themselves in the foot, which is very easy to do. So we're almost at time. I have two more bigger questions that I want to get all of your opinions on. Um, but Kyle, I'll actually start with you. So perfect, you got the mic. I guess when we look to the future, we are going to see more traditional capital enter the VC, the, sorry, the Web3 space. And I guess there's always been a tension between the, the inherently decentralized nature of a lot of the Web3 projects and values and then the more centralized or um, power heavy hierarchical nature of, of traditional VC funding. But, you know, we've seen Yuga Labs, Proof Collective and other significant Web3 projects globally take combinations of this kind of capital. Do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing to bring more of this centralized capital deployment into a space of distributed ownership? Uh, so I, I personally believe choice is a great thing and it's powerful. Um, so and and cap, more capital available for founders. Um, yeah, just just allows for more things to be built, tested, and tried for users. So. I'm, I, I try and be pragmatic. I'm, I'm certainly a, a maxi in terms of Web3 values. Um, I would, I do think having the capital and having these groups come in, if centralised, means everything's a trade-off, I suppose. So what you might find that a VC brings to the table is fantastic for you and as a founder and your company and your user base. And if that means that you, you know, sacrifice in other areas from taking centralised capital, then that might be the great decision to you, for you. So I think... Yeah, overall, I'm, I'm. I think, yeah, everyone should be welcome. Yeah. They they can have their value proposition, and their value proposition can stand up against value propositions of angels, Web three, VC funds, investment DAOs like ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, but choice of founders is ultimately a positive thing. Yeah. And Ben, when you think about future rounds, do you think you would experiment with a mixed model of capitalization? You've got more of a traditional model right now. Could you see yourself going to a distributed kind of community led round? Yeah, I mean, our seed round it actually includes a lot of our members. So we went to our membership platform. So we have a couple of thousand members that pay for our services and we went to them first and actually said, hey, we've got this round coming up, you know, it's open to you. So I love that idea of, you know, crypto, really, the decentralization aspect, everyone can participate. Um, and I think it's valuable, especially if the, the consumers of your product believe in it that much and they love it that much that they can actually own a piece of it. Like that's, that's crypto, right? So even whether it's equity or a token, it's still the, sort of the same concept. Awesome. And Simon, in 30 seconds or less, because <laughs> we're almost at time, I guess, you know, we're in a bear market right now. We, we don't know how long this is going to last. But, you know, have we seen this before? Are there cycles that we can learn from? And how should we be feeling about the future? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is useful um, to 
bear in mind that there may be further to go down. And, you know, I have been through quite a few of these cycles. As I said, I started investing in 99. So, you know, made some investments and saw how long it took for the sort of dot-com thing to, to really turn around. Um, you, people will ask you and friends and family will probably say to you, why are you still doing this? Doing this? Don't you know that stuff is all... It's all shit. Everyone knows that now. You know, game's over. Move on to back to a real job. Um, you will get that and you'll get that more and more. So uh, what I would say is you do have to have a little bit of faith and these cycles, they, they do go again and again and there will be a coming out of this cycle. It may happen in, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's going to happen in 23, 24, you know, 24. That's when it's definitely going to happen. It may and it may not. Um, you know, the cycles have been connected to Bitcoin halving, but they've also been connected to monetary tightening and loosening. Um, they just happen to have coincided over the last couple of cycles. So it's hard to know exactly what it is, but almost certainly... Well, certainly, I'm confident there will be the next up cycle. So, you know, if you're with a project that you genuinely believe in, not a project that you think is going to make you kind of wealthy in the next 25 years, or in the next two years, but something that you genuinely believe is going to bring and add value to the world, then I'd just say stick with it because, you know, there, there will be an end to this. But it will feel, believe me, it gets really bleak. I remember in 20... 18 and 2019 it was bleak i remember listening to you know i used to listen to podcasts to try and keep give me hope and i was listening to fred wilson and he's like i don't even know if this is going to work now <laughs> and you're like fuck if fred wilson's giving up jesus um so you know but just just go through it it, it comes out the other side Awesome. Well, with that, we might wrap up. I think the uh, the summary is this metaverse is big enough for all of us <laughs> as far as Web3 and traditional VC funding, and we're all going to make it, according to Simon, but it might take a while. <laughs> um, but thank you uh, to Simon, Kyle, and Ben for joining me on the panel, and thanks to NFT Fest.